If you clicked on this video, that probably means you're looking at getting into home labbing. Either that, or you're looking to justify your decisions from some random guy on the internet. What I want to do though, is answer a few questions around home labbing. What is it? Why do people do it? And most importantly, how do I get into it? First off, what is home labbing? And I don't think there's an official answer, but my Webster impersonation leads me to the definition that home labbing is the approach to further your knowledge in the technology field through hands-on learning commonly in target areas like system administration, network engineering, and software development. However, different people have different ideas of what home labbing is, so I'll never gatekeep that idea. I think for me, home labbing comes down to just hosting things. Hosting whatever you want, on whatever you want, and however you want. So what's my definition of a home lab? Something you can do this to. Probably shouldn't have really unplugged them. Jokes aside, a home lab isn't defined by the hardware or the software that's running on it. It's an environment where you can play, test, and learn without breaking and taking down someone else's environment. Home labbing is two very distinct things. One, it's a playground to learn, experiment, and build skills that will help you if you're in an IT profession like system or network administration. And two, it's a place to self-host applications and services that are important and useful to you. Home labbing is the process of bringing all the pain of the workplace home with you, a bit like being married. But in all seriousness, it's a great way to scratch that technical itch, to learn new technologies, to improve your job prospects, and have general utility through improved security and privacy at home. Home labbing is the best hands-on way to learn about technology. By setting up your own home lab, you can experiment, make mistakes, gain valuable knowledge and experience without the likelihood of causing a whole company-wide outage. Always remember, with great power comes a great power bill. So you might want to look in some lower power devices for your home lab. That's a good idea too. All right, me again, but this time with an ad. This video is sponsored by Into The AM, and I know what you're thinking, dang, Brett, you make them things look good. I know, but for real, I only took this sponsorship after I got to try out their stuff and personally vetted it. Based on the fact that I'm making this ad, it's good stuff. They have all kinds of quality clothing from slick graphic tees, Henleys, everyday shorts, and even underwear. One thing I appreciate is that you can buy completely unbranded tees if you're about that life. Personally, I like to mix it up a bit. Graphic tees for fun and then a couple of buttons for when I got a dress to impress. You think I'm joking, but I've actually personally ordered more with my own money. The quality and comfort you get for the price is just insane. If you're true Ray Dalles fan or just like quality clothes that feel good, then check out Into the AM for up to 60% off until December 8th during their Black Friday sale. Also, using my link below will get you 10% off site-wide on your entire purchase. So as someone with a YouTube channel, it's way easier for me to justify my Wizard of the Oz as server room when people ask, why? Outside of that, it's not always an easy question to answer. Why do you have a home lab? Well, for a lot of people, the answer is very different and none of them are better than the other. One is that you may just want to learn more about this area of tech. Honestly, that was my reason for getting into home labbing. People are curious creatures, so when we find something that makes us tick, we gravitate towards it. Some people may get into home labbing because it helps them further their professional career. This isn't really a reason for me, but I do have a real world example. In my home lab journey, I started messing around with Kubernetes and eventually spun up my own cluster to practice on. A few months later, at my real job, a Kubernetes project came up for our group and guess who the only one with Kubernetes experience in the group was? Yep. Another common reason is to reuse old hardware. The pace at which tech is evolving and being produced very much outpaces the longevity of previous hardware. So when people upgrade to their newer hardware, it's very likely their old hardware is still very usable. Whether you wanna take advantage of that for the environmental impact or for the cost benefits, doesn't really matter. Reusing hardware is always a good thing. And the last reason I'll talk about is that people are moving towards wanting to self-host their own storage and apps. Why rely on Big Brother storing your data in the cloud when you can do it yourself? Why pay for a dozen streaming services when you can host your own media server? I mean, I know why. It's just easier to pay a monthly fee and not have to do anything, but it was more of a rhetorical question. Basically, there are plenty of reasons why you may want to get into home labbing, and honestly, I don't think you even need a reason. If you just think it's a cool hobby, then so be it. 
Now, the main point of this video is going to be how do I get into home labbing? There are kind of two ways to approach this. You can have an established software stack that you're looking to run and then choose your hardware based on that. Or you can have the opposite where you already have the hardware and basically say, cool, what can I run on this? There are some common entry points into home labbing though. One big one is with Raspberry Pis or other low price SBCs. The reason is pretty simple. They're cheap, capable, and use very little power. Another one is by going with an off-the-shelf NAS, so something like a Synology, Asus Store, Ugreen, or TerraMaster. I have videos on all of these, and the common theme these days is that these solutions do so much more than function as a NAS. Nowadays, your NAS will have a whole app store, run Docker, handle virtualization, and even some networking. This makes the barrier to entry super easy since the learning curve is low, but oftentimes you'll pay the price with, like, money. Then of course you have everyone's favorite entry point and that's to reuse old desktop PCs or servers. These are great because they're cheap, powerful, and extremely flexible. However, when you have this blank canvas to start with in so many possibilities, a lot of the times you can have choice paralysis and never do anything. Well, luckily for you, I'm gonna try to help you out with that. If you're bringing your own hardware, there are plenty of operating systems you can go with, like plenty. However, there are operating systems specifically designed for home labbing. Well, maybe not specifically designed for home labbing, but they're very common in the home lab community. The big three are Proxmox, TrueNAS, and Unread. Yes, I know there are more, I know, but for the purpose of this video, I'll be talking about these three. Let's start with Proxmox. Proxmox is a Debian-based hypervisor OS that primarily focuses on being a one-stop shop for virtualization in LXCs, or Linux containers. Personally, this is what I use. If you're looking for a way to get most out of your hardware by running plenty of different virtual machines, then I like Proxmox for that. For example, my main server runs Proxmox and inside of there, I have quite a few VMs like TrueNAS, Windows, a few Linux distros, an AI instance, and all kinds of stuff. It's just fantastic for this as the VM management is, in my opinion, the best around. Also, backing up and restoring VMs and storage is super easy. You also have a sort of app store with their LXC templates. LXCs are Linux containers that are similar to Docker containers, but not quite as popular. I will say Proxmox isn't the most inviting OS for most users though. The learning curve can be a bit steep if you don't have experience with something like this and may require you to do a bit of Googling to get certain things functioning the way you want. Another thing is that it's not really designed to be a NAS at all. There's no Samba or NFS management in the UI and these services aren't even running by default. Hell, this is the main reason I run TrueNAS as a virtual machine. That makes for a smooth transition into TrueNAS, I guess. TrueNAS is, to nobody's surprise, a NAS-focused operating system. There are actually two versions of TrueNAS, Core and Scale. Core is the OG built on FreeBSD and Scale is the hot new guy in the office built on Linux. For the purposes of this video, we'll be talking about Scale since I think it's definitely the more popular option for new deployments. I actually just did a video recently on some of the new features of Scale, so if you want to get a bit more in the weeds, then check that out. So yeah, it's primarily a NAS OS, so if you're looking to build a system to host a storage server, then this is a great choice. It runs ZFS, which is a popular cow file system that provides neat features like snapshots, RAM caching, deduplication, and more. One of the cons is that with all of these features, ZFS can be more taxing on your hardware. Now, TrueNAS isn't just a NAS OS. The move to Linux has opened up the world of Docker, meaning we can leverage one of the most popular container deployment platforms in the world. And I keep saying container, which may make sense to a lot of you, but for the rest of you, just think of containers as apps. And that's a very archaic way to describe it, but for this video, it'll do. Since we can use Docker on TrueNAS, that means that we have the benefit of a great NAS combined with the extensive support for hosting applications. Right now they have an app store, but it's not very robust. My personal recommendation would be to just use Portainer, which is a Docker orchestrator that will make learning and deploying Docker containers so much easier. If you don't mind fiddling around a bit, then Scale is honestly a solid choice for hosting your home lab goodies. As for virtualization, uh, I don't think TrueNAS is the play yet. I haven't had much luck there, so if you're looking to host a bunch of VMs, then maybe look elsewhere. Or maybe not. You obviously don't have to listen to me at all. The last operating system I want to discuss is Unraid. 
This is another Linux-based hypervisor OS that is extremely user-friendly, has a robust app store, solid virtualization, and an active community. So what's the catch? Well, this is the only paid software I've discussed. You can try Unraid for a limited time, but to use it as your main system, you'll have to shell out some dollar dues. I'd say this is technically a con, but listen, I'm more than willing to pay for quality software. I've talked about it in other videos, but I'm in the camp of thinking that open source software is great, and the folks who dedicate their time to developing said software are saints. But at the end of the day, it's hard to always have high expectations for things that are free. Unraid is where it's at and is as good as it is because they have that income stream to pay developers. Anyway, it's just a solid all around OS that is easy to get into. One of the most noteworthy features of Unraid is its ability to take drives of all different sizes and consolidate them into a single pool with redundancy. As far as I know, no other system does this. It may not perform as well as others, but the ability to keep drives out of landfills that were only going there because they weren't the right size to expand your array is pretty great. I actually had a colleague come to me expressing interest in running their own server, and with his lack of experience and his goal of just wanting things to work, we settled on Unraid as his system. Another thing that is kind of different about Unraid is that it runs off of a USB drive. Kind of. All of your necessary files for booting up as well as your license are stored on a USB drive. Then when you start up your system, everything is pulled into RAM and will run from there. I don't know if that's really a pro or a con, just something to note. Now those are the big three when it comes to home lab operating systems, but we actually have a bonus one, Windows. Yes, you can run a home lab off of a Windows machine if you want. Directly in your Windows machine, you can set up storage spaces and network sharing for a file server with redundancy. You can install a virtualization software like VirtualBox for deploying VMs, and you can run WSL for Docker Desktop. Boom, you've got a whole home server right there on your desktop. I know plenty of folks will turn up their nose at the idea of this because there's this stigma in the home labbing community that Windows is for playing, Linux is for the real nerds. But here's the thing, Anyone who tries to gatekeep you from home labbing by trying to put down your setup is a loser who gets off to sniffing their own farts. If you're comfortable with Windows, then by golly, use Windows. Here's a little secret. I actually run a Windows server to host my NVMe pool and take advantage of 100 gig networking with ROCE. So when it comes to hardware, I've talked about various things like Raspberry Pis, NASes, old servers, but honestly, the hardware really isn't too important when you're getting started. The main thing you want is to focus on the CPU because that is gonna drive the most important aspects of your system, which are the power draw, the core count, virtualization support, PCIe generation, the number of PCIe lanes, and the RAM type supported. Most of this can be found by just Googling the processor model and it's gonna be right there in the product page. In general, anything recent enough to support DDR4 RAM from the consumer side is usually good enough to get started, whether that's AMD or Intel. Yes, you usually sacrifice things like PCIe lanes and enterprise features like ECC or IPMI, but consumer hardware is oftentimes way cheaper and easier to get than newer Xeons or Epic systems. The last real thing is x86 versus ARM, which is basically Intel and AMD versus Raspberry Pi and other SBCs. That's kind of beyond the scope of this video, but if you're looking for a true virtualization all in one server, then just stick with a standard x86 setup. If you just want to run some Docker containers, then snag an ARM system. Well, I've said a lot here, and honestly, it doesn't even cover a fraction of home labbing, but I hope it was enough to get you started. If you want a way too broad TLDR, use Proxmox if you want virtualization, use TrueNAS if you want a NAS and Docker setup, Use Unraid if you want something easy and don't mind spending some money. Use whatever hardware fits your budget and your use case because there will always be a software stack out there for you. I really want this video to inspire people to dive into the home lab world because honestly, it's a blast. Let me know down in the comments how you got into home labbing and some advice for those out there looking to do the same. If you like this video, then drop a like and subscribe if I didn't scare you off because I make a ton of videos about this stuff. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my super easy to use home lab server with all the bells and whistles. Y'all are the best. And if you're still watching, you're Casa OS. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next one.